Hear me in the booth? Loud and clear, Lisa. Oh, good. Thank you, sir, for letting me be in a real studio. It's a genuine thrill, sir. Could I cover you with one request? Sure thing. No synthetic sound, please. I want all live musicians. Something is wrong in America, no doubt about it. There's a new religion appearing, many of it called, many of you call it the New Age religion, and it appears to be the exact opposite of the Old Age religion, meaning the religion of the Jews and the Christians. It's not really that different. I've studied it. I've talked to people who practice it. They claim it's not a religion, but it is. Christ has ceased to become a man, the Son of God, the actual 
manifestation of God in the flesh on earth, and has become the consciousness, the Christ consciousness. And anyone can be Christ if they have this Christ consciousness in the New Age religion. Now, these are the two religions, the Christian religion and the Jewish religion, that set the United States on its course because these religions taught that mankind had some basic human rights. They held that the family was the basic unit in all of the world. They believed in the right to private property. They believed in the unalienable, which is defined as being incapable of being surrendered, right to life. They held that each person had the right to worship their God, and they held that all had the right to freedom of association, as shall be so disclosed during this series. These positions were deemed to be self-evident by those who wrote the American Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and became the cornerstones of the American civilization. The term self-evident, folks, means that these human rights were not worthy of debate because they stood on their own simply because they were true. They could not be debated because they were creator-endowed, endowed by God. Yet, folks, today these cornerstones of American life are no longer self-evident to many. They are being publicly discussed. People and organizations are now debating whether an individual has the basic human rights to life, liberty, and property. There's a great danger in this. Frederick Wilhelm Nietzsche, a German philosopher and one of the teachers of many of the world's leading communist revolutionaries and international socialists, put the argument quite succinctly in this statement, quote, I condemn Christianity. I raise against the Christian church the most terrible of all accusations that any accuser uttered. It is to me the highest conceivable corruption, unquote. Remember, the priests, the initiates of the mystery schools, believe that Christianity is a corruption of the mysteries, the worship of Lucifer, represented by the sun, the light, Osiris. Tex Mars, an author who has written in opposition to the New Age, wrote this about their hatred of the Christians. Quote, the New Age believer is told, you could be a god in the next instant if only those horrible Christians weren't around with their poisonous attitudes, unquote. That thought was illustrated by another of the important New Agers, David Spangler, who wrote this in his book entitled Reflections on the Christ. Quote, we can take all the scriptures and all the teachings and all the tablets and all the laws and all the marshmallows and have a jolly good bonfire and marshmallow roast because that is all they are worth, unquote. So the New Age, like the Masons, feel that Christianity is the enemy, a force to be countered, not by open debate, but by contempt and ridicule, and as shall be illustrated later, by even murder. And remember, the source of the New Age movement is the order of the Freemasons. Other parties wish to join the debate. In 1911, the Socialist Party of Great Britain published a pamphlet entitled Socialism and Religion, in which they placed their position about religion into the arena. Quote, it is therefore a profound truth that socialism is the natural enemy of religion. A Christian socialist is, in fact, an anti-socialist, Christianity is the antithesis of socialism, unquote. So the socialist, the New Ager, and the Mason have declared war on the Christians. And, as in every war, the enemy must be defeated even by bloodshed if necessary. This war has deep roots in history, and I will cover those roots so that you will understand it perfectly where this came from. This war is no different Bloodshed is anticipated by all parties in the battle. Lavetti Lafferty and Bud Hollowell, two New Agers, started the discussion about how their religion sanctions the use of violence against the Christian community. They wrote the following in their book entitled The Eternal Dance. Quote, This is a time of opportunity for those who will take it, apparently meaning the New Agers, the initiates of the mystery religions, socialists, for others, apparently the Christians, if the earth is unsuitable for them, 
If they will not accept the New Age religion, they will go on to other worlds, unquote, which simply means they will be exterminated. You better listen to me, folks. I am a messenger, and my message is unmistakable, and it had better not fall upon deaf ears, for those deaf ears will be rendered dead in the coming New World Order. Another New Age spokesman, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the guru sought out by the rock and roll group known as the Beatles and others, has been quoted as saying, quote, There has not been and there will not be a place for the unfit. The fit will lead, and if the unfit are not coming along, if they will not accept the New Age religion, there is no place for them. In the Age of Enlightenment, there is no place for ignorant people. Non-existence of the unfit has been the law of nature, unquote. Another example of New Age thinking on this vital issue came from a pamphlet available in a bookstore selling New Age material. It was published by something called The Guardian Action Publications of New Mexico, and it was entitled Cosmic Countdown. This pamphlet alleged that it had received these thoughts from something called higher intelligence, and it directed its attention to the hunger disease problem in the third world, and the pamphlet simply stated, Quote, the world should be forewarned to be on the lookout for diseases which have been suppressed for years, suddenly rearing their ugly heads and decimating populations already on the verge of starvation in the third world nations. Although these peoples will eventually be replaced by the new root race about to make its appearance in a newly cleansed world, nevertheless, for the moment, this is a tragedy, unquote. You see, they have made incredible admissions, but none of you are looking, none of you are reading, none of you are absorbing. In fact, most of you are so stupid that you think that the only thing you should read is what you personally believe in or agree with. How can you exist in this world ignorant of the opinions and the writings and the thoughts of everyone else, including your enemies? The words reveal an incredible scenario. You see, these people in the third world nations are going to be entirely replaced by what they call, quote, a new root race, unquote. That eventuality will not be a tragedy. The tragedy is that these people are dying now due to starvation and disease, but when they die later or they're all gone and they're replaced by the new root race, that won't be a tragedy. The concept that a new race of people will inhabit the world in the New Age millennium has been expressed by other believers in the religion. Ruth Montgomery, previously mentioned, has written about that change. Quote, those who survive the shift will be a different type of people from those in physical form today, freed from strife and hatred, longing to be of service to the whole of mankind. The souls who helped to bring on the chaos of the present century apparently the Christians and the Jews, will have passed into spirit to retake their attitudes, unquote. To show that the New Agers are talking about the physical death of the enemy, one must only search the writings of other New Agers. Another believer to write on the subject of the destruction of those who will not accept the new religion was Ruth Mont Montgomery. And she has been quoted as saying in a transcribed interview carried by a magazine called Magical Blend, quote, Millions will survive and millions won't. Those who won't will go into the spirit state because there is truly no death, unquote. Estimates of the number to perish have been made by some New Agers. One who has made such an estimate is John Randolph Price, who was quoted by Tex Mars in his book about the New Age, and he said that, quote, John Randolph Price was told by his spirit guide that up to two and one half billion might perish in the coming chaos, unquote. And we already know that the goal of the plan called Global 2000 is to deplete the population by 2 billion people by the year 2000. Now, that estimate is about half of the current world population, 2 and 1 half billion. Another estimate of the number required to die because they will not accept the new religion was offered by the so-called Tibetan master, Dwal Kool who has said in one of his channeling experiences that one-third of all humanity must die by the year 2000. And that would be about two billion people, at least. Channeling is one of the strange activities occurring inside the New Age religion. I have witnessed this, 
witnessed this, and I can tell you most channelers are just fraudulent, fraudulent con artists who are taking the money of those who pay to hear this channeling from dead spirits or ancient teachers or other world spirits. Some of the believers claim that they have the ability to call forth the deceased spirit of someone who lived many years before. Quite often, these spirits claim to be the ascended masters, those who have gone on to discover the eternal truths of all creation. One such believer who claimed to be in touch with a master was Alice Bailey, previously mentioned. Her spirit called himself Joal Cool, and she claimed he spoke through her saying, quote, Death is not a disaster to be feared. The work of the destroyer is not really cruel or undesirable. Therefore, there is much destruction permitted by the custodians of the plan, and much evil turned into good, unquote. Now, just what the plan constituted was told to the world by Benjamin Krim, another New Age leader. He placed an advertisement in about 20 newspapers all over the world on April the 25th, it's April the 25th, 1982, that defined the term. The ad read in part, quote, What is the plan? It includes the installation of a new world government and new world religion under Maitreya, unquote. But perhaps the most startling example of the teachings of this new religion came from the pen of Barbara Marx Hubbard, one of their most articulate writers, and she wrote in her book entitled Happy Birthday, Planet Earth, quote, The choice is, do you wish to become a natural Christ, a universal human, or do you wish to die? People will either change or die. That is the choice, unquote. So the people of the world will be given a choice. They will choose to accept the new religion, or they will choose to die. The battle lines are drawn. Choices will have to be made. I have made my choice. What is yours? Some of the leading socialists of the past have shown that they too have chosen up sides. One such individual was Adolf Hitler, the head of the German government during World War II, who held no conviction that the murder of over 50 million people during that war was wrong. He considered himself to be an agent of this unseen God in reducing the population of people that he held to be undesirable. He wrote, quote, I have the right to exterminate millions of individuals of inferior races which multiply like vermin, unquote. And he did what he considered acceptable inside his religion. Those who did not believe in his new religion had no choice, and they perished. The evidence that Adolf Hitler was a New Ager will be presented later in this series. Another of the leading spokesmen for the socialist position was George Bernard Shaw, a well-known writer during his day. He wrote a book entitled The Intelligent Woman's Guide to Socialism, in which he stated, quote, I also made it quite clear that socialism means equality of income or nothing, and under socialism you would not be allowed to be poor. <laughs> You would be forcibly fed, clothed, lodged, taught, and employed, whether you like it or not, whether you're useful or not, even if it were discovered that you had not the character and industry enough to be worth all this trouble. You might be executed in a kindly manner, but whilst you were permitted to live, you would have to live well, unquote. Socialism is the greatest perversion deception and lie that has ever existed on the face of this earth and has brought nothing but misery, death, poverty to people who have been subjected to its cruelties. The Masonic writer Albert Pike placed the Masonic order into the discussion when he wrote this in his book Morals and Dogma. Quote, it is not true to say that one man, however little, must not be sacrificed to another, however great, to a majority or to all men. That is not only a fallacy, but a most dangerous one. Often one man and many men must be sacrificed to the ordinary sense of the term to the interest of the many. The interest and even the life of one man must often be sacrificed to the interest and welfare of his country." Unquote. The religious view is that the sacrifice of one life for the interest of the many is murder. And those who believe in the God of the Bible are told not to commit this act, 
The commandment against this practice is contained in Exodus 20, verse 13 of the Old Testament, and in Matthew 5, verse 21 in the New. And it's simply expressed in these simple words, quote, Thou shalt not kill, unquote. The principle is easy to understand. No person has the right to take the life of another. This understanding is nearly worldwide. There are, of course, course cultures that have determined that human sacrifice, cannibalism, and murder are acceptable forms of behavior, but these are rare in the history of man. But here we are being exposed to a whole new religious view, one growing daily in size and stature that openly advocates the wholesale slaughter of entire races of people. Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Bavarian branch of the Illuminati, has also endorsed this new conviction that murder was not improper by including it in the initiation ceremony into the order. He has his initiator tell the initiate, quote, Behold our secret. If in order to destroy all Christianity, all religion, we have pretended to have the sole true religion, remember that the end justifies the means, and that the wise ought to take all the means to do good which the wicked take to do evil. Unquote. The initiate was told that he may use whatever means murder included to achieve the goals of the association that he was joining, and that the major goal of the Illuminati was the destruction of all religion, including Christianity. That meant that if Christians physically stood in the way, they would be removed by simply murdering them. Weishaupt even went so far as to say that anyone, anyone not willing to take the life of another was unfit to join the Illuminati. He wrote the following in a letter to a fellow member in 1778, quote, No man is fit for our order who is not ready to go to every length, unquote. Weishaupt wrote that again, this time using different words, quote, This can be done in no other way but by secret associations, which will, by degrees and in silence, possess themselves of the government of the states and make use of those means for this purpose, which the wicked use for attaining base ends. Unquote. Now, Weishaupt, folks, was aware of the enormous power of government, and he desired its power for his members. He committed his organization to its infiltration. Then he committed it to unspeakable purposes, anything that would further the goal of the Illuminati. He even went on to grant permission to his members to distort the truth by lying. If it would further their goals, he wrote this, quote, there must not a single purpose ever come in sight that may betray our aims against religion and the state. One must speak sometimes one way and sometimes another, but so as never to contradict ourselves, and so that with respect to our true way of thinking, we may be impenetrable." Unquote. And you wonder why politicians continually lie, and continually break their promises. And no matter who you elect, Republican or Democrat, it doesn't make any difference. Perhaps a perfect example of an oath that these initiates take somewhere along the road to the pinnacle inside the secret society was given in a book written by George Orwell entitled 1984. Mr. Orwell has an initiate into a secret society called The Brotherhood in his story ask these questions. Quote, Are you prepared to give your life? Are you prepared to commit murder? Are you prepared to commit acts of sabotage which may cause the death of hundreds of innocent people? Are you prepared to betray your country to foreign powers? Are you prepared to cheat, to forge, to blackmail, to corrupt the minds of children, to distribute habit-forming drugs, to encourage prostitution, to disseminate venereal diseases, to do anything which is likely to cause demoralization and weaken the power of the people? Are you prepared to commit suicide if and when we order you to do so? This folks, is an example of the philosophy that the ends justify the means. The initiate should do as he was required as long as the act benefited the brotherhood. There is no morality under such an oath. So murder of the unfit, those unwilling to adopt the new religion, will be acceptable, and those who do the annihilating are to feel no remorse. In the view of the New Age religion, the murderers have served mankind well. But this callous disregard for the right to life of every human on the face of the earth has been predicted before in the New Testament. John was moved to write in John chapter 6, verse 12, quote, Yea, the time cometh 
that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service, unquote. The New World Order, ladies and gentlemen, will sail in on a sea of blood. We have to take a short break now, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Can you hear me in the booth? Loud and clear, Lisa. Oh, good. Thank you, sir, for letting me be in a real studio. It's a genuine thrill, sir. Could I trouble you with one request? Sure thing. No synthetic sound, please. I want all live musicians. Don't forget, folks, Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m. to 11, Lafayette Hotel, 2223, El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego. 
That's Monday, March 15th. I'll be there from 8 to 11, the Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard, San Diego. I'm going to present a lecture with uh, quite a bit of videotape entitled The Sacrificed King and prove to you once and for all beyond any shadow of a doubt that John F. Kennedy was not killed by our government but by the mystery schools, specifically the branch known as the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. You will see the missing frames, the footage of the Zapruder film that the public has never been allowed to see before. You'll see it with your own eyes. You're going to see and hear things that are going to stretch the bounds of credibility, stretch your imagination, but it will all become clear to you. You will have no doubts when you walk out at the end, exactly who killed Kennedy and why. Well, let's continue here. The New Age religion, folks, is going to have a worldwide leader, a charismatic political and religious leader that they call Lord Maitreya. At least so far, that's who they call him, or that's what they call him. This individual, as far as I know, has not made his public appearance yet, but the New Agers claim that he is on the earth at the present time. They claim that he came to live with the Asian community in East London, England, in July 1977 by descending from his ancient retreat in the Himalaya Mountains along the border of India and Tibet. They further believe that his imminent emergence into full public view is assured. They also claim that this individual is the one that the Christians call Christ, the Jews call the Messiah, the Buddhists call the Fifth Buddha, the Hindus call Krishna, and the Muslims call the Imam Mahdi. In other words, all of the major religions of the world are awaiting the arrival of this one individual. It is their claim that this one individual living now in London is the one expected by all of these religions. However, when we search London, with a fine-tooth comb, we can find no trace of any living individual named Maitreya or fitting this description, are recognized as this religious leader. Isn't that strange? And they say that he is on the earth now, patiently waiting for the appointed time to reveal his existence to the peoples of the world. They say that he will apparently assume the leadership of all of these religions, and when he does, he will create a one-world religion. The New Agers have written that in the esoteric tradition, previously defined as being intended for or understood by only a cho chosen few as an inner group of disciples or initiates, in other words, the esoteric means hidden. They claim that the word Christ is not the name of an individual, but the name of an office or function within the spiritual hierarchy of masters. They claim that the masters are a group of perfected men who have guided human evolution from behind the scenes for centuries, and they believe that this Lord Maitreya is that Christ. Now, Manly P. Hall has written of this individual by identifying him as, quote, the way, the truth, and the life, which coming to every life redeems all who accept it, unquote. Tex Mars has quoted this individual as saying, quote, My army is ready for battle, my masters of wisdom and myself at the head. That battle will be fought for the continuance of man on this earth. Rest assured that my army shall triumph, unquote. Well, it appears that the battle to be fought between the followers of Lord Maitreya and the rest of humanity is still in the future. But at least one of the participants has an army already prepared. How about you? One who claims to have seen the birth in a vision of someone who seems to fulfill the requirements of this Maitreya was astrologer Jean Dixon. Her major claim to being a prophet is her prediction, reportedly made before the event of the assassination of President John Kennedy in 1963. However, her credentials were dealt a serious blow in 1968 when she also prophesied that the Soviet Union would be the first to put a man on the moon. <laughs> Another of her prophecies was that the Republican Party would be victorious in 1968. And it was with the election of Richard Nixon, a Republican, 
but she also predicted that within the following decade, 1970 to 1979, the two-party system as we have known it will vanish from the American scene. She further predicted that Richard M. Nixon had excellent vibrations for the good of America and would serve the country well. <laughs> so you can see that she is a very accurate person from which to judge the course of the future. If you want to know the truth, folks, I am the most accurate prophet of future events in history. In history. Those who question her inability to correctly predict that America, not the Soviet Union, would become the first to place a man on the moon, and that the two-party system has not vanished from the scene, and that President Nixon apparently did not have good vibrations for this nation and would later be removed from office by the event commonly referred to as Watergate, can only presume that she must have been given inside information about the assassination of President Kennedy. And that would account for her knowing at least in that event the true future. Secondly, one can only wonder why this non-prophet should be listened to about anything after her appalling record on prophecies. But there is reason to believe that she might have been asked to write an account of this vision of the important birth by the New Age religion because they wanted the official imprimatur of someone commonly referred to as a prophet. In other words, folks, her prophecy might have been written to legitimize his claim to be a man-god, so that when this individual made his public appearance himself, the public would marvel at the fact that his birth had fulfilled a prophecy. <laughs> but in any event, Ruth Montgomery wrote a book about her entitled The Gift of Prophecy, in which she wrote about the very revealing and intriguing vision that Jean Dixon allegedly had. Quote, the vision, which Jean considers the most significant and soul-stirring of her life, occurred on February the 5th, 1962. She saw the brightest sun she had ever seen. Isn't it funny how that sun always pops into this stuff? Now remember that reference to the sun, folks. Stepping out of the brightness were a pharaoh and Queen Nefertiti. Remember here that these two individuals were Egyptians. And this will become significant later on. In fact, it's already significant if you've been listening to this show. The couple thrust forth a baby as if offering it to the entire world. Now another interpretation, because they sprang from the sun, could be that this is Osiris and Isis and the child is Horus. And that is exactly the esoteric real interpretation although Jeannie Dixon never said this. Jean looked at the baby and then said, according to the author, quote, I knew here is the beginning of wisdom, unquote. Remember what I told you? Osiris is the doctrine, Isis is the church. The child Horus is the body of illumined initiates. So what Ruth Montgomery wrote can be summarized as follows. A sun deity gives the world a child from Egypt who possesses enormous wisdom, and this event allegedly took place on February the 5th, 1962. The interpretation of these symbols have already been discussed and will continue to be discussed during this series, and the significance will be plain to all. Jean then says, quote, a child born somewhere in the Middle East shortly after 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on February the 5th, 1962, will revolutionize the world. Before the close of the century, he will bring together all mankind in one all-embracing faith. Mankind will begin to feel the great force of this man in the early 1980s, and during the subsequent 10 years, the world as we know it will be reshaped into one without wars and suffering. His power will grow greatly until 1999, and this year is extremely significant, as will also be discussed, at which time the peoples of this earth will probably discover the full meaning of the vision." Unquote. So according to this vision, a child born on February the 5th, 1962, will grow up to bring a one-world religion onto the face of the earth, and his efforts will be successful in 1999. 
The New York Times newspaper folks ran three consecutive articles on the conjunction of five planets, the sun, the moon, and an invisible body that astrologers call Ketu, starting on February the 4th, 1962. The first article stated that the various bodies moved into rough alignment in the constellation Capricorn at 7.05 a.m., New York Times. The Capricorn remembers the goat. In history, the goat was the goat of Mindy's, or the ram. And the newspaper article also says that they would remain in that alignment until 7.17 a.m., New York Times, Monday. The goat of Mindy's, the ram, is also another word or another name for Lucifer, Satan. However, the article went on to say that most of the people in India became alarmed because most astrologers were making predictions of disasters. There were a few astrologers who were predicting good for the world as a result of this alignment, but few Indians appeared to be paying them much heed. Now couple that with Gene Dixon's prediction that the child was born on February the 5th, 1962, midpoint in this alignment, and what do you get? <laughs> They're going to great pains to prepare the world for something. Astronomers did not consider the event to be rare, however, and the article went on to report that the same configuration had occurred several times in the past, the last time being in April 1821, and then it occurred twice. The article reported that Dr. Kenneth L. Franklin of the Museum of Natural History, Hayden Planetarium in New York, had commented that, that that year does not seem to be a year of any remembered disasters. He was then quoted as saying, and that year isn't famous for anything, as far as I know. <laughs> Dr. Franklin also commented on the body the astrologers call Ketu. He speculated that it may be some sort of astrological addition used to make everything come out right. He then added that he believed Ketu to be the invisible planet that is frequently taken into account in astrological reckonings, but that he had no idea how it was possible to keep track of something that no one could see, and as far as he knew, didn't even exist. The Times carried another article the next day, Monday, February the 5th, 1962, the date that this supposed child was born, and it repeated the concern of the Hindu astrologers. In fact, that headline read, Hindu astrologers still say it's doomsday. And the subheadline read, Peaceful beginning of planetary event is viewed gravely. Now, the third article in the series ran on Tuesday, February 6th, 1962, and carried the headline, quote, Doomsday in India, uneventful, unquote. <laughs> the article reported that the Indian astrologers had predicted a variety of disasters, earthquakes, tidal waves, devastating fires, and warfare, to name but a few, but that none of these events had occurred. Furthermore, the article reported that Hindu priests had claimed that the reason nothing had happened was because their prayers to their God had been answered. But folks, none of these three articles mentioned the birth of anyone on these three days. Furthermore, none but a few astrologers had believed that something good was going to happen, and that only a few in India had even listened to them. Only Gene Dixon, another astrologer, had seen a vision of something beneficial, in this case the birth of a baby full of wisdom at about the midpoint of the three-day affair. One can only wonder if once again she missed the mark and was involved in another error, or if she was intentionally made to set up the world to welcome someone named Lord Maitreya. In any event, these people claim that the Lord, Maitreya, will appear shortly to the entire world and start everyone off on a road to a one-world religion. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, in her book entitled The Secret Doctrine, called him, quote, the dragon of wisdom, unquote. So it appears that the one call that Jean Dixon made that appears to match other comments is her statement that the baby she saw in her vision was full of wisdom. If the baby she claimed to have seen in her vision was Lord Maitreya, then she was right because others have claimed that Lord Maitreya is full of wisdom. 
However, there is still reason to believe that she was given inside information by some New Agers who wanted to have this Lord's birth prophesied so that when he did surface, the New Agers could claim that his birth had been a fulfilled prophecy. So the world awaits the visible appearance of Lord Maitreya. Ladies and gentlemen, dear listeners, so that you would realize that I'm not making any of this up, I took last night's program and tonight's program verbatim from the introduction all the way through chapter 3 of a book entitled The New World Order by my good friend A. Ralph Epperson. Again, the title of the book is The New World Order by A. Ralph Epperson, and you can order that book in any good bookstore. If you can't find it in your area, Contact us, and we will make arrangements with Mr. Epperson to be able to furnish that book to you if you would like to purchase it. I also recommend that you purchase my book, Behold a Pale Horse. It's a handbook for what's going to happen in the coming years, especially in this country. And without it, you will be crippled. If you would like to purchase my book, Behold a Pale Horse, if you're a CAGI member, send $25. That includes postage and handling. If you're not a CAGI member, send $30. That includes postage and handling. Also ask for a packet of information on how to join CAGI and all of the other things that we have available for you. Send it to Stan at Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Or you can call Stan at 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. While you're at it, folks, reach way down deep into your pockets. Make a check or money order out to WWCR to help us pay for this airtime. If you like this show, if you want it to continue, then please make out a check to WWCR and send it along with your request for information to Stan. Folks, we are nearing the end of the road of civilization as we know it unless we wake up, unless we take control and make sure the future is what we want it to be. And one of the things that we must do now immediately is stop fighting amongst each other. Stop fighting the man who doesn't look like you or the woman who doesn't look like you, the people who have a different skin color than you do. We must learn to live together, and it's nobody else's business what somebody else's religion is. It doesn't hurt us if they want to practice their religion as long as they are not hurting us in the process. So why go to war with them? We are all brothers and sisters in this world, no matter who we are. Let's learn to live together and love each other. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you.